Tifa Tashin is a card game of negotiation and corrupt politicians trying to make as much money as possible. One player is the president, and each round they are given a selection of money cards equal to the number of players. It's up to them to divide up the money between the players however they like. They could give all the money to themselves, spread it out evenly, or play favourites with certain players. The money will come out in mixed denominations, and the president isn't allowed to break these down, which is a clever way the game forces an uneven distribution of money to immediately make players jealous of each other. Once the distribution is decided, everyone has a chance to discuss how they are going to vote with their action cards. The president and the players receiving the most money will want people to vote yes, because they won't get the money if more negative votes than positive ones. But and this is where it gets interesting, there are better cards to be spending your action on than voting. If you play this card, you can take from the treasury, getting a free money card off the top of the deck. But only the first person in turn order to play that action gets the money. This is usually the president who gets greedy, assuming his minions will vote to keep him in power. The game is certainly true to its theme. You can also choose to blackmail someone, each player has an agent meeple they can place in front of another player, and if they play their blackmail action card, they will steal a card at random from that player's stash. This works nicely because the threat of being blackmailed will often stop a player from voting, especially if multiple agents are outside their door. If the president wants to ensure a positive vote, he can place his agent in front of the player he's not giving any money to that round as a threat of blackmail. However, if a player is certain they are being blackmailed, they can play their avert blackmail card, which turns the tables, allowing them to steal money from the person trying to blackmail them. It's a lovely slice of bluff and double bluff. Players also have the option to bribe each other by placing face down money in front of another player with a wooden token on the top. They can ask for one of four things, to vote yes, vote no, or simply not to vote yes, or not to vote no. The recipient can take a peek at the money. If they follow the terms of the bribe, they will get the money, otherwise it goes back to the player. Again, I really like this option, it's a very simple system. Bribes don't happen as often as I'd like because players are loath to give money away because it's money that might win them the game, but the option really enhances the negotiation. If there are more no votes than yes, the money gets put back in the center and the first person to have voted no becomes the new president. The old president can't take part again until this money has been successfully distributed. The presidency can switch hand many times as players try to get the best deal for themselves. It's always a fun question of how much corruption you can you get away with, how much money can you pocket before you get ousted. Often it's the president in the spotlight being overly generous just to stay in power, and the player who wins the game with the most money was never in power, but was pulling the strings from behind the scenes. Tifa Tashin is a very streamlined negotiation game, and yet it works. Everyone's just trying to work out the best way to make the most money. Do you put up with a president who is keeping you sweet, or try and overthrow him to become president yourself? All of my favourite negotiation games like Nothing Personal, Spartacus, Game of Thrones, Sons of Anarchy, Bootleggers are long, three hour or more games. It's nice to have a card game that gives you a taste of negotiation in 45 minutes, so I'll be keeping this one. That's Tifa Tashin, designed by Fabian Zimmerman. Seven Wonders Duel is a two-player card game from fated designers Antoine Bowser and Bruno Catala, based on the very popular pick and pass card game Seven Wonders, but in this game you're picking cards from a grid on the table. On your turn you take a card from the face-up ones available to you, pay the cost and add it to your city. For example, you might build a quarry which gives you stone to help you build other buildings in the future. There's a palpable desire to be as efficient as possible, getting the materials you need to build what you want because if you end up having to buy missing items, it can be costly. Other buildings are simply for prestige and worth points at the end of the game. Another way to get points is by building one of your four wonders, and these grant you bonuses for doing so, such as money or extra turns. But you don't have to win the game by getting the most points, there are two other paths to victory. If you put your efforts towards building up a military, you can put the sword to your opponent. For each military expansion, this marker will move towards your opponent, and if they don't or can't build a military to push it back, you can score an immediate victory by getting it all the way to their side. The third way to win the game is to prosper in science. If you're able to research five different fields of science, you immediately win, so it can be a fierce battle trying to stop your opponent from getting the science cards they need. These three options make for a very interesting game that requires you to keep an eye on all of them. If you neglect your military, you'll likely pay for it. 
And I like that, it's thematic, but it also makes for a heated game as every decision must be considered with each victory condition in mind. When you take a card that uncovers a face down card, it's flipped and revealed. There's a suspense to each reveal, hoping that you'll uncover the card you really need and praying your opponent won't find it. At times it can be frustrating. There's no avoiding that you will end up gifting unrevealed cards to your opponent and it will be the luck of the draw what turns up for them. Finances are tight and you can choose to discard cards to get money. The more trading cards you have, the more money you'll make, which is a clever touch. And if your opponent has lots of a resource and you need to pay for it, it's gonna cost you more. There's a few very clever rules that give this game a surprising amount of depth. No small action is not without its cost and its reward. If you play against someone who knows the game well, they will school you. If you research two of the same type of science, you get a progress token, which provide big bonuses or nice ongoing powers. These are randomized each game, and with the selection of wonders and the layout of the cards, each game is going to present a new challenge, albeit one that has a very similar feel. Seven Wonders Duel is a game I respect immensely. Many people call it their favorite two-player game of all time, and I can completely see why. It's very easy to get into, it plays in about 30 minutes, and yet has an incredible depth of strategy. I don't personally love it. I like it, I find it challenging, but it doesn't excite me. I find the theme to be dry. There's this vain attempt of a theme to put names on all the cards. The artwork is superficially pretty, but utterly soulless. I don't feel for a second like I'm leading a civilization. And yet, some of my favorite two-player games are completely abstract such as Arboretum, Onitama, and Patchwork. I was hoping to enjoy playing this one with my girlfriend, like those other games, but this one didn't click for us. It lacks the pure simplicity of those games. The sandbox strategy makes for a more impressively designed game, but one we enjoy less. For a couples game, we want a clearer focus. A brain-burning Euro game doesn't suit our needs. Ultimately, this is a gamer's two-player game, and that's where I've enjoyed this, playing someone who knows it and has their head in the game. But even then, I feel like with all the setup, I'd rather play something else, something I enjoy the theme of. And since I play games for the social aspect, I hardly ever play two-player games outside of with my girlfriend, so I'm not sure where this one sits for me yet. I like it as a game in a limited context. It remains to be seen whether it's worth hanging on to just for that. Pantheon is an expansion to Seven Wonders Duel that gives players even more options. The gods are getting involved, and you can pay them to use their powers. In the first stage, you'll have the opportunity to pick up mythology tokens. These are available when you pick up the card which would reveal the face down card holding the token. In Seven Wonders Duel, it's always frustrating to free up a face down card for your opponent. Now there's an incentive to do it. The mythology token matches a set of cards. The Mesopotamian gods have science-related powers, the Roman gods are military-focused, and so on. You can look at two and decide which one to place in the pantheon of gods and where. In the second age, as an action, players can pay money to use one of the gods' powers. The price you pay depends on where it's placed in the pantheon, which is why the placement in the previous round is important. If you find a god that you know your opponent will want, you can put it over on your side, meaning it will cost them eight gold, but only cost you three. It's a neat idea, but it doesn't feel that exciting. The difference of five gold is not enough to put you off buying something you really want, or bankrupt you if you do. And the gods are powerful. Nisaba allows you to copy an opponent's science symbol, and Ishtar counts as the law science symbol. Either one of those could win you the game. Ra allows you to steal an opponent's wonder. Being able to pay to use a god does allow you to skip a turn of having to remove a card from the grid, which might allow you to avoid revealing a card for your opponent. However, we found that the opponent was inclined to just follow suit, activating a god themselves, extending the stalemate. In the third age, the guild cards of the base game are replaced by grand temples. These are worth 5, 12, or 21 points, depending on if you build 1, 2, or 3 of them. They can be built for free if you own the right mythology token, which can feel a little lucky if the temple matching your token comes up, but it also further incentivizes collecting those tokens in the first age. Pantheon is a solid expansion. It adds a few extra elements which don't overcomplicate things, and in return gives you a little more to think about. It doesn't transform Seven Wonders Duel into a different game, and it hasn't made me fall in love with the game but I think the right god at the right time could create some big moments and certainly give players new avenues to victory if other options don't pan out. 
If you play 7 Wonders Duel all the time and want something to mix things up, then I'd recommend getting it. Otherwise, it's by no means a must buy. Raise Your Goblets is a party game about poisoning your fellow diners during a medieval banquet from Horrible Games and Simon. This is a game that came out at Essen that I was really excited about, not least because it comes with these awesome plastic goblets. Everyone begins the game with wine, poison and antidote tokens, and you're assigned a target, the person at the table you're trying to kill. This is public information, so everyone knows who is after who. On your turn, you get two actions. For an action, you can place one of your tokens secretly in any cup, peek in your cup, rotate the circle of cups left or right so that everyone's cup changes, or swap your cup with another player's. Eventually, a toast is called and everyone has to drink. You pour out your cup and if you have more poison tokens than antidotes, you die. You get a point for surviving, a point for killing your target, and a point for drinking the most wine. Then you all get reanimated for the next round. Once the toast is called, everyone has one last action, ending with the person who called the toast. This usually involves a lot of switching cups. But you can feel a little impotent switching your cup to save yourself, only for the person after you to switch it back. Unless, of course, you're able to bluff, tricking them into taking a poisoned cup from you. The toast caller, who has the last action, is in an incredibly strong position, possibly too strong, as they get to pick whichever cup they like. To be able to call Toast, you have to have placed all of your wine tokens. I've seen many players rush that process to be able to call Toast first, and they usually prosper for it, which makes the game feel a little formulaic. I'm sure it's possible to trick those players to make sure the cup they are filling with wine they think is safe is poisoned through bluffing, but there's so much going on in this game that it's very hard to pull off thought-out moves like that. Raise Your Goblets has a very demanding memory aspect. You're trying to track which are the poison chalices and which are the safe ones, and keep an eye on their movements. A tricky feat in itself, but most of the time you don't know which are which, you're just assuming based on other people's actions. You have to remember what you think someone put in a cup. It's sheer chaos. On a basic level, I like the idea of looking someone in the eye as they place a token in my cup and deciding whether they're poisoning me or whether it's safe and they're trying to trick me into thinking it's poison. It's a fun challenge and reminds me of the bluffing game Cockroach Poker. But there could be 20 tokens placed in a round and I can't keep track of what I thought in all those instances, or where those cups even are now. And factor in the other player's desires, not only to kill their target but avoid being killed by the player targeting them. It's too much to ask in any game, especially a party game, and ends in players giving up, feeling like they have no control. And I'm sad to say that this is the experience I've had with Racial Goblets. Everyone I've played it with has complained about there being too much to memorize and not enough control. Players who can handle heavy Euro games, others who love party games in all their forms. I found that I've been the only one trying to remain positive, hoping that the game will click for me and repay all the anticipation I had for it. I was in love with the unique theme, a party game with such incredible components and artwork. It felt like the kind of game that could wow newcomers to gaming, but everyone I've played it with has refused to play it again. I can't resist hoping that if the rules were tweaked, maybe with less actions or taking out the toast phase, the game could be made fun. It's such a neat core concept. But I think I was just so invested in the idea of Raise Your Goblets that it's hard for me to let this one go. With a heavy heart, I don't recommend this game. Caribou Camp is a light family game from Jigamic that is inspired by an old public domain game known as Canes, Kent or Kemp's depending who you ask. They've tweaked it, added some adorable artwork, and thrown in a squeaky dog toy. In Caribou Camp, you play in pairs, which switch up each round. Everyone is simultaneously swapping cards from their hand with ones on the table, trying to complete a set of five identical cards. When they do, they have to secretly communicate it to their teammate, who has to grab the squeaky exclamation mark and put it on the right animal. You see, each animal has a corresponding body part, so if I collect a hand of squirrels, I need to use my ear to communicate to my partner. If it's chipmunks, then I can wink, and if it's a moose, I use my tongue. I love this part of the game. One of my favourite party games is Wink, where you have to subtly wink to another player without anyone noticing. Caribou Camp takes it up a notch by introducing different types of gesture, which makes it harder for your opponents to catch you. In the public domain game, teams will agree on a secret symbol before the game, and if the other team thinks they have spotted it, they can get points. 
I like that Caribou Camp simplifies it by prescribing seven different signals because it makes the game easier to run but also makes it more equal. In the original game you could play against some geniuses with the world's most intricate signal that you'd have no chance of ever noticing. If you think you've spotted an opponent signaling to their teammate you can grab the squeaky pepper grinder first, guessing the animal and claiming the points for your team. This means that the game is tense at all times. It's a lot of fun trying to swap out cards whilst also keeping an eye on all the other players. And your partner will drive you crazy in frustration when they're not looking at you to receive the signal and another team grabs the win instead. I love those climactic moments in Caribou Camp and having a squeaky adult toy to grab makes it that bit more entertaining. My disappointment with Caribou Camp and the game it was originally based on is that those moments don't happen as often as I'd like or more that they do, but only after you reset the game each time. Once someone has grabbed the squeaky letter I, the round is over. You have to take all the cards back in, shuffle them up and deal everyone's hands again. It's a fair amount of admin to have to do in exchange for one climactic moment. In Wink, you get secret signals and accusations, but the game continues on immediately after. I wish that Caribou Camp had the ability to run continuously without the constant stoppages especially since you could get so close to completing a set every time and never get a chance to grab the squeaky champagne flute because someone else got luckier with the cards and got there first. Caribou Camp won't appeal to most adults, but we had fun with it. It's not one of my go-to party games, but I'm hanging on to it and I will pull it out for anyone looking for some silly fun. I suspect it would really shine when playing with kids. Checkpoint Charlie is a light family level deduction game I picked up at Essen from Spanish publisher De Vere. In this game you're competing to catch the Chief of Spies, correctly identifying which of the similar looking cats is the target. Each player secretly knows one characteristic of the target cat, whether he's wearing a hat or not, whether he's grey or orange, whether he's wearing sunglasses or not, whether he's wearing a coat or not, and whether he's carrying a newspaper or not five different on-off traits, giving us 32 unique cats to fit all possible criteria. On your turn, you take a cat from the draw pile and either place him in a row because he matches your characteristic or in your discard pile because he doesn't. Everyone takes turns quickly and whilst they do, you have to try and work out what you know from the other players. You can be misled by the game as someone continuously puts grey cats in their correct row, you think the cat must be grey. Little did you notice that all those grey cats are carrying newspapers as well. You have to keep your wits about you because it's not just about deciphering which characteristics to look out for, but remembering them and finding the right cat. You need to rush to put your detective token on the right cat first, and when the pressure gets to you, you might not notice that he's wearing glasses when he shouldn't be. As the box describes, it's a game of observation and mental agility, and that's definitely accurate as you try to juggle all the information you know in your head. It's not an easy thing to master. If another player has picked the cat you think is the target, you can still bag some points by placing your token on a cat who meets four out of the five criteria, which is a nice compromise to not being quick enough. The last player to place their detective gets nothing, and if you accuse a suspect who doesn't meet four or five characteristics, you may get minus points. Checkpoint Charlie works well for what it is, a simple speed deduction game. I found that some players are inclined to slow down proceedings on their turn as they try and wrap their heads around everything, which is basically unintentional cheating. And some players, as with games like Ghost Blitz, just don't have the mental agility to compete at all. With a collection of sharp or at least equal minds, it's a fun race to catch the culprit and a quick game to learn and play. It's a lot better with five and not so great with three because two of the characteristics will be revealed by the game so it's much easier to remember them. It's not a game that I plan to keep in my collection but I think it could be a good one for families and the artwork is really nice. That's Checkpoint Charlie.